to my thinking, one of the quintessential American speakers, quintessential American sound. So if you think Altec Lansing, JBL, Klipsch, all of them have direct radiating 15 inch woofers very often and horns. So the American sound, to my perspective, is always a direct radiating woofer and horns in that horns give scale and woofers, direct radiating woofers, like here, give us the chest thumping sound that we all have, all want. Whether it goes deep or not, we want to feel it nonetheless. So the Klipsch La Scala and Klipsch K horn uh, are folded horns and they're very fast, they're taut, they're also very polite. And so when I think of a La Scala or a K horn, it is to some degree a more European voiced speaker. It's polite, uh, it's controlled, it is not raucous, typically. And they're also difficult and cumbersome to build. You need special jigs to get the miter cuts correct and building the, uh, to get the compound angles needed to build the horn geometry correctly. Whereas a Cornwall is just a square box, rectangular box. It's very easy to build. So the Klipsch Cornwall uh, is a rather big speaker. We'll have it in the PDF. It's 6.5 cubic feet big, which means it's 35, in 35 inches tall, 25 inches wide, 16 inches deep. It's a huge, huge speaker. Because of its size and the woofer it uses, its base is plentiful but flabby, most people would say. Everybody who's had a Klipsch Cornwall from a Cornwall 1 to a Cornwall 3, uh, the base was not as taut as one would want, but it was voluminous. What we've done in this cabinet is shrunk it by 30%. So instead of the cabinet being 6.5 cubic feet, it's 4 cubic feet. Uh, so instead of it being 35 inches tall, it's 30 inches tall. Instead of it being 25 inches wide, it's 20 inches wide. So in so doing, you actually make the back pressure on the woofer uh, more appropriate. The base is more linear. It goes deeper. Uh, and you get a better speaker out of it. So size isn't always everything. So back to the Klipsch Cornwall versus La Scala question. The Cornwall had horns that go down to about 700 hertz, six or 700 hertz. I guess it's 600 hertz. Uh, they use the same driver as the La Scala and K horn, which crossed over at 400 hertz. The lower crossover points are generally considered a better idea. Uh, so the Cornwall had the big thunderous 15 inch woofer, but had subpar horns. Thus the Corn Scala was the idea of melding the horns originally from a La Scala with the direct radiating woofer of the Cornwall and the easier to build cabinet. What that idea has morphed into in the last 25 years is both the Cornwall 4, it's essentially a Corn Scala, and the idea that you take the very best horns, very best compression drivers that you can, and you stuff them into the smallest cabinet you can get with a 15 inch direct radiating woofer. Thus again, the Corn Scala we have here. So why a corn skull, I guess, is one of the best first questions. Um, I, as a younger audiophile, Andy can attest to, um, couldn't afford really lovely gear, but was willing to build it. And if you build tube electronics uh, and keep your power demand, you know, don't want to build overly powerful tube amps, you can build them at modest prices and get exceptionally good performance. And so that's where I started out as a hobbyist and as an audiophile. So the Cornwall and most Klipsch Heritage products are exceptionally efficient. Uh, some speaker manufacturers overstate the efficiency of their speaker. Uh, Klipsch, you know, in general doesn't. So this woofer is 98 dB efficient, which means this speaker is 98 dB efficient. So for one watt of energy, you're gonna get 98 uh, decibels of sound pressure. That's more than you normally listen to music at. Most people are not listening at 98 decibels. Um, it, it, unless they're trying to piss people off or, or enjoy the, the loudness of things, uh, in, from my perspective at least. So 
if you have a five watt single ended amp like my like I built for my headphone amps, or you have a 15 watt tube amplifier like a Dynaco ST35, which is one of my favorite amps of all time, uh, you have a fantastic sounding system. The Dynaco ST35 was called the poor man's Macintosh 275. 27, Mac 275, you know, in modern day dollars is a $6,000, $6,800 amp. You know, uh, what was that, $600 to $800 back in the 60s, where uh, a Dynaco ST35 was a $65 amp. You know, it was much more accessible and was a really lovely sounding amplifier. 15 to 17 watts is more power than you ever need for these kinds of speakers. So, what's the point? If you have a Nelson Pass Amp Camp amp that you bought off of DIY Audio and you built, which puts out five to eight watts, and then if you buy a second one, it's now a 15 watt amplifier, you know, that's a Nelson Pass design, you have a fantastic sounding system. You can buy from DIY Audio the, the uh, Pass F6 kit, and you build it and you have a 25 watt single ended no feedback solid state amp fantastic you buy any dynaco kits you buy anything from amps and sound it's going to power it and it's going to power it exceptionally well so you don't need a 100 watt tube amp or a 200 watt solid state amp to make you feel like you can fill a house and have a dance party and have all the tone and texture that you want so that's why efficiency matters from my perspective altec lansing and JBL got out of the game of building this kind of speaker in the mid 70s to early 80s. You know, these used to be stage monitor sized speakers. Clips, for the most part, was much more domestically friendly. They were not always a pro audio company at the same level that Lansing and JBL were, you know, as far as units sold and whatnot. Uh, so the, the, the Cornwall ended up in people's homes more often than the JBL did. But, you know, JBL was really famous for having awesome bass and big horns. JBL believed in big horns uh, more than Klipsch did. Uh, and so the Korn Scala is sort of mirroring that same idea again. Big horn, little cabinet, big woofer. Super efficient, and you don't need big power. That said, you need quiet amplification, you need wide bandwidth amplification, and you need something with tone. If, you're, if your amps have no soul, uh, they're gonna hurt your ears with horn-loaded speakers. So that's sort of the punchline of the why. So uh, why make it smaller? I started building corn scalas after reading the Klipsch Forum and then there's Bob Kreitz is really famous and a great resource. So if you look up Bob Kreitz, is a, builds kits and sells kits for people for these kinds of speakers, but they're based off of the, the stock Klipsch size factors. Uh, so the basic math typically for this woofer is two feet cubed. That's the basic math. So that's what a La Scala base bin is. This same woofer is used by Klipsch in their La Scala, in their K-horn, and in their Cornwall, and then used to be in what they called their Bells. Uh, so Klipsch was really good about platform sharing. <laughs> uh, their mid-range, they used different mid-horns but the mid-range driver was the same mid-range driver and it was actually the same tweeter. So the cabinet changed, the crossover changed, and the horn changed, but not the actual driver components changed. One of the first cabinets I built was two foot cubed and it was just a base bin for the woofers. And I wanted very much to have like the rock of Gibraltar and so I made it an inch and a half thick on all dimensions. So the cabinets were double layered, three, three quarter ply and braced and I think they each weighed like 150 pounds, 200 pounds. And, and I had them on a, a riser and, and they were super cool. They were also the size of refrigerators. <laughs> they, were, they, they were heavy and stupidly large, uh, but they were big. I mean, think, you know, two feet cubed with sidewalls that are an in, inch and a half thick. You know, they were just, and I moved these things around on my own. Um, and it just didn't make sense, you know? I used to think that having a separate bass bin was the, what I wanted to do, in that the separate bass bin allowed me to change my horns. And it was when I 
you know, explored a lot of different horn options. And for that reason, a separate bass bin is really helpful because then the base of your system, the woofer and the geometry and port calculations are correct for the, for the start of your system. But if you have a life, a family, an audio file that changes things constantly, um, or you don't like dust on things like I don't, having your crossover exposed and all the wiring exposed is a rather unfinished look and it always looks like you're a tinkerer and not enjoying actually listening to music. I am a tinkerer, but I also enjoy listening to music. So eventually I came around to the idea of separate top hat, a top hat and a bass bin like this, what Klipsch did for their industrial Escalas. And then I started coming around to the idea, much like I do with my amplifiers, that like I don't rebuild amplifiers. If we make a change, we make a new amplifier. We don't tweak platforms like, you know, when it's done, it's done. When, it, when it's done and finished and tested, it is as it is intended to be and doesn't come back for slight tweaks because it was a full-fledged concept and idea that was executed upon. And I think the same way about speakers. I would rather build another speaker and try a new idea than tear apart a speaker, goof up the finishing. I think that having a fully conceptualized idea is always really important. Uh, I built a set of what are called Klipsch Jubilees, which is two 12-inch woofers. So it's like a, a Klipsch K-horn, but about uh, a foot and a half wider. It's huge. It's, a, it's uh, four feet wide by four feet tall for the bass bin, plus your horns. It's an exceptionally good speaker, but it does not belong in a home. It doesn't belong in a home that I own. It, it's, it's too big. Speaking about these speakers in the specific, the mid-range driver typically, like this one here. So th this compression driver is 108 dB efficient. The only way to have the speaker speak from one voice, sound cohesive, is to attenuate the mid-range driver to match the low frequency driver or be very close. Because if you don't, what you hear is low frequency energy and mid energy, and they're not at the same speed and they're not at the same presence and it, it doesn't sound great. So sure as the sun rises, this is attenuated to this. If that is the case, what you base the efficiency of the speaker on is the least efficient biggest thing in the, in the box, the woofer. Now for horn loaded bass bins, like a La Scala, like a Bell, like a K-horn, the folded geometry adds to the efficiency of the driver. It's like the only way that actually one plus one gets you three. <laughs> And so depending on who you ask, you add either between 3 dB and 5 dB of efficiency, depending on the horn, the horn geometry and horn shape, horn flare, uh, to the efficiency of the driver. So when they say, when Klipsch tells you that a Scala is 101 dB efficient, they're not lying. When they say a K-horn is 103 dB efficient, they're not lying. It, if they were to say, that a La Scala is 103 dB efficient, not 101, and a K-horn is 106 dB efficient, um, it is more curious. But again, that's, that's insanely efficient. You know, at 98 dB, you need a one watt amp. <laughs> Maybe three watts if you're wanting dynamic range. They, they play really well against a, a room, in, in against a wall. The reason I like corn scallops. One of the other reasons I like corn scallops, and I used to like the heresy. The heresy is now rear ported, which means that it's boundary dependent. Its base output is boundary dependent on its distance to, to the back wall. Uh, that didn't used to be the case, but the way they got the heresy to stop being a 60 hertz speaker is by porting it. The corn wall and all of my designs in general when I build a speaker is front ported so I can put it I have a tiny room, it's 12 by 12. Uh, it has to be against the back wall in general to make it work. Otherwise you're just too darn close to the horns. And so if it is front ported, in general you can argue the point that it doesn't matter how far away it is from a wall. So uh, back to the point of like, do I think a corn wall is too big? Yes, I think a corn wall is too big. The corn walls to get 
tighter base and to be more cohesive, newest Cornwalls use high order filters. High order filters don't image particularly well without a little throttle on them. So low level listening is not their preferred, it's not where they're really gonna to come together. So I like filters that are lower in order in general for these kinds of speakers because you get good enough separation, but you still have a speaker that is listenable without your wife being angry at you at, at 12 o'clock at night. So you get the detail that you want from the horn, but you don't have to have it so loud that you're gonna bother people. You know, there's tolerable loud, and then there's like someone coming out from bed without the pillow off of their head and looking at you cross-eyed loud. Um, here's what a, a stock Cornwall looks like dimensionally. Here's what I suggest dimensionally. The whole point of this video, from my perspective, is to democratize uh, building this speaker. A corn Scala is like a VW Beetle. Anybody can build it, and you can turn it into a Porsche if you want to. And that's, and that's really the, it's a platform more than just a speaker. If you follow these steps, you'll have an exceptionally good speaker, but you also will have a platform that will let you grow if you wish to. That's, that's an important aspect of things from my perspective, because here, here's an example. The horn in this, the, the horn in this speaker and the horn in this speaker are the exact same. They are a uh, Fatal horn called the LTH-142. This one is completely stock, so it's a 1.4 inch horn. It goes down to 500 hertz, and it goes all the way up to 18,000 kilohertz. That's why it's a two-way speaker. But this one I modified so that it can accept a two-inch driver. So this one uses a 1.4 inch driver. This one has been fully hot-rotted to accept a different driver. In addition, I dynamatted the horn. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, and then I sprayed the back of the horn uh, after dynamating it black so no one really noticed. The front of the horn was coated with a special epoxy that makes it stiffer and harder, less resonant. This horn, again, it's you know uh, a $150 horn. You can get one off of eBay though to your door for 50 bucks. This, this basic horn, which is, if you buy it from Parts Express, great reliable provider for it, or USA speaker, and you buy the Fatal HF140 driver, you have a complete system. It will overperform from 500 hertz to 18,000 kilohertz without any issue. However, if you wanted to take it upon yourself to be a hobbyist like all of us are at some level, this horn, you, with four screws, you can unbolt the back, and instead of it being a 1.4 inch driver, it becomes a two inch driver. We took some MDF, we made a new mounting flange for it, and now we have a two inch compression driver instead of a 1.4 inch compression driver. Is there less distortion at 500 hertz if your diaphragm is 1.4 inches or two inches? The general thinking is the bigger the diaphragm, the lower it goes with less distortion. Now, this driver from BNC costs the exact same as the Fatal. This is, a, uh, this is a monster of a driver that is essentially, from my perspective, a clone of a JBL driver that costs $800. This costs $250. The JBL version costs $800. They're both titanium for the diaphragm. And then there's a third option listed from Radian that I, that on my spreadsheet. It's a 1.4 inch from Radian part numbers listed. The reason why you'd buy the Radian is today it comes with the aluminum diaphragm, but Radian is the only company that's authorized to sell replacement beryllium diaphragms for TADs. Meaning that Radian beryllium diaphragms are as good as TADs. Maybe you want to argue that point. Radian makes a 1.4 inch beryllium diaphragm. This speaker has the Radian driver not the BNC and not the Fatal. Because whenever I decide to make it really special, I'm going to drop in two beryllium 1.4 inch uh, radiant diaphragms into it, take all of about 20 minutes to do, and I'm going to have a two way <laughs> corn scala with beryllium diaphragms. Kind of cool.
And again, it's this platform where it can go and move with people. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start showing how to build this and why to build it, but I'm gonna come back to the horn question. This is probably the best domestically available horn for, for corn skulls that's around. It's 150 bucks, it's from Fatal, you can buy it from Parts Express. But my buddy Dave Harris, who I, I have learned more about horn-loaded speakers from Dave Harris and Al Klappenberger of ALK Engineering than anybody else I know. Al Klappenberger designs filters for radar installations. Al wanted a better horn for his clip speakers, better than the Altec uh, 811 horn. So Al decided to build his own, do the geometry himself and did a formula. So what you have here is probably one of the very best uh, horns that can be bought at reasonable cost. So what you have here is an elliptical Tractrix horn. Same as here. This is an elliptical Tractrix horn that's made out of ABS. To make, it, to make its performance even better though, you have to stiffen it with Dynamat, maybe some extra spray paint. Completely worth it though. But for $300, Dave sells a set of these and you have to sand it. Now I have sanded 12 of these in one weekend and we'll never do that again. But if you're building just two, you can muscle through sanding these because these come with like all the ridges from cutting it on the CNC router. And you have to start with like some 40 grit sandpaper, you know, wrapped around a Coke can kind of thing, work, working it down. Show them the backside. Yes. So if you can see all the ridges, so they're, they're individual layers of MDF that then get doweled and glued together. Now, Dave's horn does 310 hertz to 18,000 kilohertz without issue, and is a two-inch horn. And some, you know, the very best speakers I've built, I use this. It is way more inert than the Fatal, but you got to be willing to sand it. Al Klappenberger and Dave put together the, the formula that did all the plotting necessary to create a Tractrix horn. So a Tractrix horn, the, the formulas are readily available. So if you want to create a what's called an Edgar horn of any size that goes low enough, you can. there are calculators that exist that will give you all the X, Y, Z point plots, and you can graph it out and then cut pieces of wood to create that horn. But elliptical horns have way better dispersion than just a horn that's like this, right? And Tractrix horns give really, really good imaging. So the reason why you have an elliptical horn is better dispersion. See how it's really wide this way? So it has a really wide sound stage, but it's compressed, if you will, on the vertical axis. So it's not beaming to your ceiling and to your floor. The whole point of this kind of horn is that you're not, you're trying to, good sweet spot and you're not interacting with your floor and ceiling because there are some really big horns that will send the energy all over the place. Then you get crazy room problems and issues. Um, so if one wanted to go to fast lane audio, they could actually pick up this horn, cut a big circle, cut a big rectangle, drop these in and you'd have a fantastic speaker. The other idea though, uh, Dave and Bob Kreitz sell baffles, this piece here already cut for people and they just mail it out to people. What I'm trying to teach everybody here is buy the baffle from Bob Kreitz or Dave Harris, Fastlane Audio, or me, whoever, whoever you need to get it from, because this is all the math. This is all the important stuff already done for you. That's hard. The rest of this stuff is panels of wood that you can get cut at Home Depot. And if you own a Craig jig kit, you can put it together. And on that PDF I showed you, there's a product called Duratex that you can get from uh, Parts Express, or you can get what's called Duraliner from AutoZone. And it's a roll-on bed liner. And no one will see any errors in anything you did if you use this textured roll-on bed liner. So back to how to build the speaker. Again, we're gonna go over, like this will be available to everybody with part numbers and prices. 
The first question was, which crossover and why? There's two crossover choices. Okay, there's Bob Kreitz, who makes a really good crossover. Uh, I think it is 275. It is voiced similar to how Klipsch would voice it. Okay, so it is a little bit more forward leaning, which is, you know, tends to be what people think of as horn loaded systems. So that sounds really good with more relaxed amplification. So if you had a set of Agers, some uh, 45s, single ended triode amp, you're going to be really set because you're still going to have the detail, but you're still going to have sort of that warm mid range. Because a lot of those amplification, the, the high frequency, the air and space, uh, and the shimmer can be lost. And so that forward lean might be a good thing for people. The other crossover is from Al Klappenberger, who is a friend and a collaborator and builds some of the very most badass crossovers that exist. Now, Al, what he did, his method to, to the madness is Paul Klipsch used autoformers uh, Altec and JBL have used auto, Altec for sure used autoformers, but this is a tapped autoformer so that you can attenuate the mid range in comparison to the woofer. So you can't change the crossover frequency, but you can change how forward or how present the mid range is or how recessed the mid range is in comparison to the woofer. So if you're somebody who wants that forward lean, you can create it. If you're somebody who wants a little bit more mellow sound, right, you can also create that just as easily. It's adjustable in one dB increments. So the reason why to go with Al's crossovers is that it's adjustable. Al, Al is very, very, very smart and his methods work. So that's the short of it. So this is what the crossover would look like after you built your cabinet. So assuming that you took my advice, you bought the baffle from Bob Kreitz or, you know, Dave or me, somebody gets you a baffle. The reason why you want the baffle like this is it's inset so that the horn and the front baffle, the front face of the speaker are flush. It looks like a finished product. It doesn't look like a hobby thing. In addition, behind this, and I'll show you when I turn the speaker around, uh, we use what's called a doubler so that instead of the woofer, the woofer is inset by a quarter of an inch so that it doesn't protrude out the front of the speaker. And it has what I would call a trough. So it has a, a ring that it sits in so that the weight of the woofer is not really held by the weight of the bolts, by the, by the bolts I use. It's actually held by the lip of the woofer. So the lip of the woofer is interfacing the side of the cabinet. And that's where a lot of the weight is being shouldered against. And there's this doubler, so instead of you compressing three quarters of an inch, you're actually compressing an inch and a, inch and a quarter with the doubler. So you have a lot more interfacing material to stiffen the cabinet and to reduce vibration. So provided that you bought the baffle, all the hard work has been done. <laughs> and what, what Dave and I figured out how to do when we did our ports is, I didn't want to buy ports from many, many companies make ports and they probably make a million ports at a time, a million pieces of plastic that are flared or different length at a time. But if you have a, a baffle, like I've had baffles that I've sat around for three years before I decided to use them, getting that part may be difficult many years later. So what we use is ABS pipe that we get from Home Depot. So the, the port calculations are on there. We all speaker drivers, woofers, have what are called field parameters, which one could sort of say is the physics of a, the known physics and behavior of a driver. In a box. Right. And when you plug in the field parameters into specific calculations, you can uh, calculate its behavior in different applications. There's a really good tool called Eminence Base Box Pro. You can buy it from Parts Express. Eminence Base Box Pro, you can say, I have this driver, and they have like a drop down menu, and it'll show you all the drivers, or you can plug in the individual field parameters. And then you say, I have this box with these dimensions, with this port that is this big and this long. What's the measured base response of my driver? 
And what this speaker, the way it's tuned with the porting, is it's an honest 40 hertz speaker. Which means that you have a 98 dB efficient speaker that goes 40 hertz in room to 18,000 kilohertz with only one crossover point. Pretty good hat trick. Now the question of, do I buy Al's crossover or do I buy Bob Kreitz's, that's a different question. That's you know what you decide is most valuable to you and how you wanna do it. They both work fantastically. The next question, the next thing we build is our horn. Whether you get it from eBay or you get it from Parts Express, the Fatal HF, the Fatal LTH 142 is a great horn. It does 500 hertz to 18,000 kilohertz, which matches the 500 hertz crossover point of my, of my crossover. And is then matched to my mid-range driver. My mid, they're one inch, so something to know, Someone might suggest, why aren't you using a one-inch horn? They're really cheap and they're really accessible. One-inch horns almost always can only go to about 800 hertz. Now, the Atlas PV55, which is what Klipsch has used for 50 years, can go down to 400 hertz and all the way up to 6,000 kilohertz. So it's really good as a three-way because most of the time, we cross over at 5,600 hertz to, the, to a tweeter. But it's really not good enough if you are trying to uh, get it to be a two-way. If you were to make this smaller and want it with a one-inch driver, you'd have to cross it at 800 hertz or 1,200 hertz. There's a lot of good drivers that are made. A lot of us remember a driver called the Selenium 220Ti. Selenium then got bought, bought by JBL. But the Selenium 220Ti went from 1200 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz. And it was the basis of a speaker called the EconoWave, lots of people built. Kind of the same idea, but smaller. Okay, so whether you're using the, the Fatal HF200, the BNC DE85, or the Radian, super badass, I don't remember the name of, uh, all of them cross at 500 hertz and all of them go to 18,000 kilohertz. The radian actually goes to 20. And when you listen to it, you know that it's going to 20. Um, so again, the crossover, the horn, or the big horn right here, right? And the driver all have to work together and all have to be matched together, okay? And again, that doesn't matter for the cabinet. This could sit just, this would perform just as well if I plopped it on right here on top, just like that. I've done it before, lots of people do it. And there's a belief by aligning the, the, the magnet assemblies, you're getting uh, time alignment. Owl's crossovers actually provide for pretty good time alignment passively without matching the distance of the, the, the uh, magnet assemblies of the drivers. I have opened and closed cabinets so many times that the screws stopped holding. I no longer use screws. In addition, I stopped what we call face mounting uh, woofers because to hold a woofer to a cabinet face mounted, which Clips used to do in their Gen 1 50 years ago corn scalas, corn walls, the screws and their tension is the only thing holding that driver in place. Whereas if you recess it, the side saddle of the driver is actually the thing that's bearing the weight. The, the bolts or screws are the things that are just holding it in place. So the weight is being held on the shoulder and the, the, the push or suck in force is hold, held by the, by the bolt or the screw. That said, this cabinet here and all of its components use quarter 20 fasteners. So, the biggest hole that this woofer will allow for on its bolt holes are, are quarter inch uh, fasteners. So everything is a quarter inch. So I use quarter inch thread certs. You can get bolts, really fancy bolts like I've used, which are called Allen heads. So they're rounded head and they use an Allen socket, you know, like for an Allen wrench. And they're black oxide because I almost always, my speakers are black, black oxide fasteners, you don't see them. 
McMaster Car is a fantastic resource for getting bolts or thread certs or washers that are of a specific size. And their application is so good that uh, you can spend a lot of money in about 30 seconds. You can go from picking out a part to being done and it's shipping to you in like 30 seconds. It's kind of bad. Because uh, you can spend money really, really, really quickly with it, unfortunately. If you see here, there's at least 12 quarter 20 fasteners, quarter 20 thread certs in this driver. And the what I call the uh, rib, per, rib plate of the back, all dadoing into place. If you have a saw blade and you cut, cut the saw, cut a trough or a groove repeatedly, it creates a dado, which is sort of a recess. And so the front and the back of the cabinet go into that recess. And so they are resistant to moving. So if you're a hobbyist and you have a table saw, it's just a question of being patient and doing all the little things that you know to make a better cabinet. So I'm gonna go over some of those ideas, okay? I have built, and we still use the Craig Jig kits that you can get from Home Depot or Amazon to 50, 60 bucks to, to create pocket, pockets to key everything together. And if you get a flush router bit, everything that you do will come out nice and look perfect when it's all done. So here are some tricks to the cabinetry that make it better. Lots and lots of thread certs, lots of bolts, no screws. The reason for this is that screws eventually get stripped out. You're gonna open and close this cabinet lots of times. Uh, people will ask, why do I even have a back that is removable when I can load everything from the front? You're 100% right, but if you ever want to service it easily, if I, was a man, if I was a manufacturer and we were building it one time and pushing it out the door, uh, this would be silly perhaps and unneeded. But I'm a hobbyist and, and a tinkerer and a trier, and you're gonna, and a, wanting to learn from things and verify things, you're gonna want to have this so that you can open it up and access everything in the, in the speaker very, very easily. So, uh, Bob Kreitz sells this bracket here, which I think, I think they're like 20 bucks each. They're money well spent. Depending on how heavy your driver is, you can put a lot of force on this plastic ABS horn. The horn is fantastic, but it's not as thick as like Dave's horn is. Uh, and all horns are weakest at their narrowest point, being right where my hand is. And so putting you know, a 15 pound driver at the back of it, you're gonna have some, put a stress fracture into it. But where if you put this bracket in, which is just a bent piece of metal, and then you put a brace right here, that brace will, uh, shoulder all the weight of that driver, transferring all that weight into the brace rather than to the back of the horn. I, uh, being obsessed with bolts, again, uh, it's bolted into place. So it doesn't just rest there. Oh, it'll never leave unless it's unbolted. <laughs> because it's quarter 20 fasteners again from McMaster Car, but you could have, I, I have bought them from Home Depot. Home Depot has you know $12 kits with 20 of them in there you know, that are inch and a half long or two inch long, depending on what you need. And with a Phillips head, that's more than an, that, that's a good enough answer. So we have a brace here. You only needed one brace. The rib plate is dadoed into place. You don't have to do that. You end up needing, if you don't do this, fur strips. A fur strip or whatever the term is called right. is a little piece of wood that goes behind a panel that holds the panel in place. It's not the best answer. It's a good enough answer. In the sheet I, I, that you were gonna share, these cabinets, I had a local cabinet maker charge me $400 to make them in Los Angeles. I think that you could probably get this done cheaper in some place other than Los Angeles. Or if you have a really good friend, it's an 18 pack of beer and some pizza. Uh, one of the things that we did, uh, is we built in these deflectors. So if you see here and here, 
where the cabinet comes together at a 90 degree angle, we cut little triangle pieces of wood and they're glued into place. The idea is that you don't have a right angle and so that the sound waves can actually bounce around a little bit easier, they don't get trapped. In theory, I, look, I am not the physicist or mechanical engineer to your know, acoustic engineer that can explain the theory behind it, but the prevailing wisdom is that by doing things like that, you get a cabinet that is more inert and better better behaved and it's cheap to do it's pieces of wood that you that you've cut on a 45 to fill in the voids of a, of a right angle corner you can buy a uh, two by two pieces of wood at home depot which is truthfully 1.5 inch by 1.5 inch and you cut it along the diagonal and that'll create your 45s and what we've done on the top ones because the top ones are easier we have braces for the ports down here but what we've done on the top ones is they're actually, you know, a 32nd of an inch a little too long. So there's a compression fit. So, when, yes. Uh, so the idea is that they're putting tension against the back, pan, the back rib plate and the front baffle so that they can't push inward on each other when, when the driver is actuating. I, Klipsch has always done uh, a riser with their speaker. And... I've seen enough and repaired enough of these to know that the riser was there as a sacrificial piece of wood when there's flood damage. So having a sacrificial piece of wood so that the whole cabinet doesn't get water damage is a really, really smart idea. I took that one step further and built a, a girding plate on the bottom of the speaker and we tapered the sides at 45s. So it looks like the speaker when it's on the ground is floating on your carpet. So, so you have just enough room to get the tip of your thumb all the way around it, but, but it's largely there. Again, I use thread certs and bolts, same bolt I use everywhere else, and it's bolted into place, thus stiffening the back panel to an inch and a half thick, or the bottom panel to an inch and a half thick, and making it so the speaker floats. And then one last little wood, wood idea to share. So, extra plywood you take the long a long piece that goes the full width of the cabinet and it goes right here and then you take a piece that fills in that void right here you glue and screw glue and nail and this now when the cabinet is put in and all the edge pieces are, are surrounded and pinched this now sucks in the center of the that piece of plywood by doing that in theory you're essentially doubling its breakup mode by shorted, by having the distance of the panel. Because now the panel is being pinched right here, it's now only half as long. And is much, much more resistant to vibration. And if it vibrates, it's vibrating at a much higher frequency, hopefully out of the audio band. So, and that's just extra plywood and a little bit of extra time. Can you build this with screws? Drywall screws like everybody does? 100%. With Duratex to finish it, it's like 2800 bucks or so, if you're looking at commercial prices. The Cornwall is an $8,000 speaker. And, it, and it's going to be, the Cornwall is going to be more beautiful. But this will have pride of ownership and will have you understand what you're listening to. And if you go one step lower on the Klipsch line to the Forte, the Forte is a $6,000 speaker. You're still in this for three grand. And if you want pretty, there's a, a veneering company that I use that's really exceptional called GL Veneer. And as I showed one of my friends, you can get rosewood, engineered rosewood veneer that is absolutely beautiful for 200 bucks for a four by eight sheet, which is more than enough to do this. And if you're really smart, what you do is you do all of the sides in the rosewood veneer the front baffle is painted black, and the rear back panel is painted black, thus to conserve some veneer. At which point you could probably get away with a $100 sheet of rosewood veneer, and you watch some YouTube videos on doing lacquer finish or, or linseed oil finish that you brush on. And then you have a really beautiful speaker. Now some little extra tidbits that I didn't put on the sheet of paper, but just to remember. Uh, I think grills are important. I have grills on my speakers. They're, they use 
double-sided magnets, neodymium magnets that you get from Parts Express. And I get my speaker fabric from Parts Express, or you can get it from, from Joann's. Um, I think grills are, 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 are a very good, important idea. If you do grills, having the, the, what's called an inset right here where I have my finger. So most MDF is either 5 eighths or 3 quarter inch. I generally, if you're going to do a grill, it's going to use 3 quarter inch plywood, right? 3 quarter inch plywood, I will have an inset of 5 eighths so that it sits proud outside of the channel here, outside of the inset by a quarter of an inch. So you want, it to, you want the, the grill to pucker out a quarter of an inch away from the speaker. And if you're really smart, you round the corners of your grill because the grill fabric, grill fabric does not like right angle corners. So if you take some 40 grit sandpaper, just round the corners. The rear of the speaker, and I've learned this one, lots and lots of experience, is inset an, an extra eighth of an inch. So this is inset approximately uh, slightly a hair one eighth over three quarters of an inch so that the rear of the speaker is not completely flush with the sides right because if you don't do that it's gonna you're gonna peel a piece of plywood somehow doing something stupid the best thing to do is by insetting it you prevent yourself from doing that and when you take your back panel um, your back panel lots of bolts if you take my suggestion right uh, bolt holes always look ugly. They're always going to have some piece of plywood missing. You can't fix that very easily. So the best thing to do, really big washers. So again, I use black oxide button head fasteners. So for this, they're all inch and a half long. And I use inch and a half in diameter washers. The idea behind that also is I'm generating more pull force, a wider area. So I'm trying to get the cabinet to be, as, the back panel to be as stiff as possible when it's fully fastened into place. So the last thing, to, the last component to talk about is wiring. Um, anybody who knows my amps knows that I have a thing for Jupiter condenser, uh, which, you know, I just got some swag from them today, which is super, super cool. Uh, I'm actually going to be building myself a Fender Champ with their parts in a little bit, so... This is going to be super cool to add to the cabinet. Um, I have traditionally used a 16 gauge wire that is the OFC copper, oxygen free copper, that is tinned with silver, plated with silver in a Teflon jacket. You can search for it on eBay. Sometimes you can find it, sometimes you can't. I don't actually know the supplier, so we'll, you're always buying someone's surplus. Um, and in all these years, I can't find the right supplier. Uh, what you wire the speaker in can change its voicing. Some people like Belden wire. Belden makes a wire that's like orange and black. It's super popular. It's not my idea of a good time. I don't use it. I use the silver plated copper. But the next best thing, and I've had really, really, really good results, this is Western Electric style wire. Doolin makes that, and now Jupiter makes this. And so this is 16 gauge. OFC copper that is tinned in a fabric jacket and twisted. So this is this is what Western Electric used in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And this is, you know, many people think that we do it new, newer, and fancier, but Western Electric always did it better. You know, this is what I'll be wiring this one in, is with Western Electric wire. And I got that from Jupiter. And again, I put a link in on the page. You know, the, the point of the speaker is, look, it allows you to, you can use big power amps and you'll, you'll love the dynamic scale of it, but you can also use really intimate, good sounding amplification that didn't break the bank to get, or vintage amplification. Like if you have this, plus like an old Magnavox receiver that you turned into an amplifier, you have a mighty fine sound, you know? And that kind of accessibility, and then the ability to, to choose whether to, to go, you know, follow the formula or to go really uh, creative and esoteric is fantastic. Um, I guess the last point, by the way, the woofer. The woofer is an Eminence Kappa 15C. So Klipsch 
their part numbers are curious. So they call this woofer uh, would be called a K43. The, em the eminence makes the woofers for Klipsch. The K33 is what goes into a K-horn, a Cornwall, and a La Scala. And it has about half the magnet of the K43. The K43 is when, what went into the Pro La Scala, the Pro Cinema series, the, the Pro K-horn, everything that, that was meant to handle more power, and more abuse, and keep on, you know, keep on ticking, right? was the K43. You can't buy an eminence equivalent K33, but you can buy an eminence equivalent K43 called the Kappa 15C. And oh, by the way, the, the woofer is twice, the magnet of the woofer is twice as large. So that that's the basics of the speaker. I'd love to answer some questions if you guys have some. Okay, why horns? Compression drivers are small, rigid diaphragms that are generally very low in distortion. Horns allow these small drivers, small uh, diaphragms, to have acoustic coupling, to have their sound amplified, to be usable. So that's the why of the horn. The, the real question though is why ho uh, compression drivers and horns versus cone drivers and the simple answer is do you like i was going to cuss but do you like speed do you like scale do you like dynamics these are the bastions so what i tend to tell people about this style speaker or horns in general is it's like having a caged gorilla it has every capacity to rip your arms off you and beat you with it these are rated to play at 124, 130 decibels. That's like having a jet airplane take off next to you. The trick of it, though, is to teach them table manners. The trick of horn-loaded systems, which are pro audio in, in concept, is to use them in a way that they are domestically pleasing, that they are not going to hurt you, that they, you know, you are never going to play a horn-loaded system at its full capacity unless you've lost your hearing. That's just the truth of it. Now, the question, you know, like if you hear the distortion from your horn-loaded system, it is probably not your horn-loaded system, but rather your amplification that's providing you the distortion. So if you want scale, if you want huge imaging, very quick, that's why you choose horns. I, I have a set of Falcon LS3 5As that are like 84 dB efficient, and they sound great on my low power amps. They, they really, really do. But the prevailing wisdom is that you need a 50 watt amp for that to, 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 start, to start to light up, right? I think, the Fal I think the LS3 kind of bends physics in that way. But the, you know, if you had uh, a Sonus Faber that's 84 dB efficient, uh, you're going to need a 50 to 100 watt amp. You know, whereas if you had a horn-loaded system, for that same level of sound, you need a 3 watt amp. 